So what I've pulled up here is the Iowa Secretary of State's website. The Iowa Secretary of State is in charge of a couple of things. They're in charge of elections, first off, but they are also in charge of business organizations in the state. So um, this is where a company would go when they first set up a business. If you want to register your business name, you do it here. You pay a fee, of course, but you do it here. The fees aren't actually all that stiff. They're usually between $5 and $50, somewhere along, along those lines. Um, if you want to form a partnership and you want it to be, you want to have that liability, that limited liability partnership, then you would go here as well and form a limited liability partnership. Remember, automatically you would be a partnership, but you would not automatically have limited liability. So you'd have to go through the Secretary of State's office and register in that way. If you want to become a, so cooperative associations or corporations, those homeowners associations, they actually have to register. They're a type of association. They may be a type of corporation as well, um, but they actually have to go through and, and uh, register. Um, let's see limited liability companies and you can see we've got different ones we've got domestic and we've got foreign so if you are a foreign company and you're operating in iowa you still have to register then within iowa if you're going to be have operations within iowa um so domestic so what do i want to talk about here domestic nonprofit corporation so if you're starting up a nonprofit organization these are the forms under here that would be filed um domestic profit corporations. Those are the ones that we kind of are probably most familiar with. Those are just the corporations. Those are your, I don't know, your Walmarts, your Amazons. And they don't have to be big, of course. They can be small, but those are companies that are organized as C corporations. They offer shares to shareholders to purchase. Um, and they, uh, what else do I want to say about them? My, I, I don't know. My, my brain is kind of scattered today, I guess. Um, domestic professional corporation. So a professional corporation is a specific type of corporation. And you'll see, you'll probably see that abbreviation a lot. PC. Have you seen that behind, like, next time you go to your dentist's office or your doctor's office, or if you ever go to a lawyer um, or an accountant, look at those professional organiz those organizations that are run by professionals oftentimes they have pc behind their name that means they are a professional corporation professional corporations they are corporations but they are they have to be owned by individuals that are working within that profession so to be a pc a law an attorney office that is uh, organized as a as a professional corporation you can't be a plumber like you can't have ownership. A plumber can't have ownership in a PC that's a that's a, a law firm, that sort of thing. So it's limited to those who are, are, ownership is limited to those who are providing those services within that profession. Um, what else? Nonprofits. Anyway, so all of those forms are up here. Let's see if we can look at the domestic profit corporation. So here's the different types of forms. Articles of incorporation, so this would be filed upon organization of the uh, of the corporation, and it said it doesn't have to be. These are all the the laws. What the law says has to be included in that article of incorporation. Now I've gone in here and I can't get back out again because. Um. Anyway, so those when you click on those, that it just it tells you the law. You can also go online and get templates for pretty simple articles of incorporation and different uh, different types of forms that are required. I wanted to show you this, just to show you how it's done in, uh, in Iowa. Now, in other states, it may be done differently and it may be handled, the business organizations may be handled by a different agency. But in the state of Iowa, it's done by the Secretary of State's office. A lot of them, it's, it's done by the Secretary of State. Yeah, you're right, that doesn't quite <coughs> All right. So again, this is a legal entity 
and then you choose to be taxed as a corporation as well. So you have to make two choices. You've got to make those choices both with the state and with the IRS. And as it mentions here, so usually an uh, appropriate state agency is the Secretary of State. There may be corporation commissions in other states. I think, I think California has a corporation commission, if I'm not, not mistaken. So companies that are incorporated have to, on an annual basis, file reports with the state as well. They have to have meetings of boards of directors now it's kind of weird when you've got a corporation that's only one person and there's a meeting of the board of directors because that's only one person, but you still have to have um, minutes of what is uh, what has transpired during that time. Usually that's done, an attorney will help do that kind of thing, but it's done on an annual basis. They have to have an annual report, pay a fee. You saw those fees there, they're not too stiff. Um, at least in Iowa, they're not too stiff. So, uh, and this is just to indicate that, that that company, that corporation still remains active. Large C corporations have to use the accrual basis of accounting. So, but only large corporations, smaller corporations don't have to use that. Um, if they have annual gross receipts over the last three years of 27 million or less, they can use the cash basis. We already looked at that rule when we were looking at sole proprietorship, so it's the same rule that applies to corporations. Um, so what else do I wanna say here? Oh, another difference. So all these other entity, individuals and partnerships are on a calendar year basis. January to December, that is their calendar year. Corporations can choose a different, a different tax year. They can choose uh, maybe April 1st to, to March 30th, and then their tax return covers that period. And the reason for that is oftentimes corporations also will have different financial statement year ends, right? They don't always end on December 31st. Sometimes, and especially depending upon the industry, they may end at different periods. So an example is like the retail industry. Apparently they like to end um, January 31st for their fiscal year end. And so they're, if they're a C corporation, they can choose to then have their tax year also run from February 1st to January 31st. Now, the reason for that is probably because of the, the Christmas season and they get a lot of corporation, a lot of retailers, that's when they get uh, a, a, the bulk of their income. And so it incorporates that period and then also returns in the, in the prior month or the, the preceding month. Um, so for example, they've got here Disney. Disney's fiscal year end is September 30th, which is right after, as I say here, right after the summer season, right? Okay, so the form is the form 1120. Remember for individuals, To my satisfaction. What's the form that individuals use? You should know this. You should, you should, should dream about this. Partnerships? 1065. 1065. Corps. C Corps use an 1120. This one's even worse than the other one. The due dates, remember for individuals, our due date for those tax returns are, is April 15th. It's actually three and a half months after 
the uh, the end of the year, the tax year. Same thing for, for partnerships. Corporations, however, it is, where is it here? The fourth, middle of the, I think it's the middle of the fifth month. Mm -hmm. Depends on the fiscal year, fiscal year ends, September. Uh, where are we here? Yes, the 15th day of the fourth month is the due date. I'm sorry, the individuals, it's the 15th day of the fourth month as well. Partnerships, it's actually the 15th day of the third month that it's due. I don't know that you're, we didn't discuss that, but does your chapter say that? That the partnership returns are due then? Anyway, um, so for corporations, it's the 15th day of the fourth month after the fiscal year ends. So if the fiscal year ends, January 31st and not December 31st, it's going to have a May 15th deadline for that tax return. Now there is one exception if we have a, um, if for those corporations that have a year end on June 30th, their return is due September 15th, June, July, August, September. That is the 15th day of the third month. Those are the only ones that it's due on the 15th day of the third month after the uh, the fiscal year end. Everybody else is due on the 15th day of the fourth month. They can file an extension for those companies that are, are filing, well, for those companies that file, uh, have a fiscal year end of June 30th, they have a seven month extension that they can apply for. Everybody's granted it, but you do have to apply for it. For everybody else, they can get up to a six month extension. Okay, so still it's a total of nine and a half months from the original due date that you can have to prepare that tax return. Now, that's for submitting the tax return. That is not the time, that is, you do not get an extension for paying the tax. And that is true of everybody. So individuals, partnerships, well, partnerships don't owe income tax, but individuals, other types of, of entities, corporations, there's never an extension to, of the time to pay the tax. It's always just the filing date that can be extended. All right, so this is what the 1120 looks like. You'll see it's not a lot like partnership return. Looks a lot like the Schedule C. Again, it's an income statement, right? All of our items of income up at the top, and then all of our expenses, same rules, Ordinary, necessary, and reasonable. All of those rules still apply to all of these expenses. And the same types of categories that we would see for other organizations as well. Now there are some specific lines like compensation of officers are separate from other salaries and wages because there are some special rules for the salaries of compensation for officers. Um, what else do we have that's different? too much I'm trying to see now these are all one all items that we would find on other types of returns as well although you can see um so remember with partnerships we had all those separately stated items we had rent income capital gain income dividends all that stuff was separate right because it was treated separately on the individual return here it's all piled together it's all piled together and it's all at the same tax rate. There are no special capital gains tax rates, no special dividend tax rates for corporations. We don't have that. Now, in exchange, what they get is a lower tax rate, pretty much overall. Um, but that's why we have items like dividends, interest, rents, royalties. They're listed on this first page. Remember for the partnership, those things were listed on the Schedule K because they were separate from ordinary income. On the first page, we were just listing our ordinary income, everything that was gonna show up in that box one. Here, we get to pile it all together. We don't have to separate it out. Um, it all gets put on this, this first page. So, uh -huh. why are you somebody put the cost of goods sold in your income? Cost of goods sold? Yeah. Well, it, cost of goods sold is going to reduce Yes. Well, you, okay, so the, the form 1120, I don't know if I have the 1125A. 
it is an expense. So, but it's it's calculated on a separate form. It's so it reduces our because we're looking at gross profit first. Remember total income and total expense. So yes, but if you recall from also from financial accounting, our cost of goods sold, we, we put that up at the top to include in our calculation of gross profit. Then we list all of our other expenses. So it's the same concept here. Um, so we're gonna reduce that, our gross receipts by our cost of goods sold to arrive at our gross profit here, and then we're gonna add all these other income items. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But you're right, it is, it, it, it reduces our income. Right. It's a, it's a negative, so. A um, couple things that we're gonna talk about in this, in this chapter that are different for corporations. One is net operating loss. Another is under these special deductions. One of the special deductions that they talk about here is this dividends received deduction. We'll go into a little bit more detail about the dividends received deduction. So remember, dividends are not taxed at a special rate for corporations, but they get a special deduction that other entities don't get. Now, dividends, recall what dividends are. These are amounts that the company, the corporation pays out to its shareholders, but they do not they do not reduce taxable income. It's an expense to the business because they're out the cash, right? But they don't get to, it does not lower their taxable income. And corporations will oftentimes own pieces of other corporations. So maybe Apple has shares in Disney. Maybe, you know, Disney has shares in AT&T. When these companies pay dividends, to other companies. Essentially, those dividends are eventually gonna make their way out to the shareholders of that company. This dividends received deduction is a method of trying to reduce double taxation, reduce the effect of that, of that double taxation. Because that income, it's not, it's not being deducted by anybody. Usually in the tax code, if you have an expense in one place, you're gonna have corresponding income in another. And the same, same holds true. If you have income in one place, you're gonna have some sort of corresponding expense in the other because one company pays another company. It's an expense to my company. It's income to the other company, right? When we're talking about dividends though, there's no deduction, but it's income. Like they don't get to deduct it. There's no deduction side of it. There's only an income side of it. So the dividend received deduction is to try and help mitigate that, okay? And that's, so we'll go through that. Um, in more detail as well. Um, corporations, C corporations also, they do pay tax. It is not a pass-through entity. It is a separate entity in and of itself, um, separate from its owners. So it pays its own tax at its own tax rate and therefore has estimated payments that it has to make, just like sometimes individuals have estimated payments that they have to make. Um, lots of other information. Oh, they got information here. They want to know information about other corporations if they own more than certain percentages of this corporation. They want to know who that is, um, or other types of entities as well that own larger portions of these of these of the corporation. They want to know who the owners are. Here is our Schedule L, this is our balance sheet. You can see we always have a beginning of the year balance sheet and then an end of the year balance sheet. Our M1 that we're gonna look at, again, starting with our income or loss per books, arriving at our income or loss per tax return, and all of the adjustments through there. I'm sorry, it's the, no, that's the, you said the M3. I'm not showing the M3. I don't really go through this one. I can't remember what they talked about the M3. Anyway, so that's what the, the tax return looks like. And I kind of told you the major points that we are going to hit in this chapter as well. 
questions right now? 